First story. OP's uncle drugged and SA'd their friend. OP went nuclear and made sure he never saw his children and wife again. Warning. This is a long story, but I promise it is worth the read. Names and countries have been changed. Some aspects of the story I am omitting, as they are far too traumatic for myself and his victims. TLDR at the bottom. About 22 years ago, my mom got a frantic call from my uncle's best friend to say he had been arrested. Apparently, an ex-girlfriend had accused him of a say, but she was just being vindictive because he broke up with her. My uncle Chad is obviously innocent. We all love him. He is our charismatic, friendly, outgoing and loving uncle. He would never hurt anyone. The family all sends money for legal fees. They are in France, and we are in South Africa. This is true because it is all over my profile. The best friend sends us all the updates. No one ever thought to Google anything. We were getting them from the source. He was found guilty, and the family was devastated. We all send money for an appeal. This goes on for two years, and then we get the call that he has been found innocent and released. After his release, he meets Lucy, who is originally from Canada. Lucy is lovely and comes from money in a very big way. He is so charming and convincing that they are married in less than eight months, a huge wedding in France. Then suddenly, they are having separate honeymoons. He was going to honeymoon in his home country Namibia, and she was going to Canada. They would then meet up in Brazil. He stayed in Namibia for a couple of days and then partied with us in South Africa. We teased him that he took his wife's surname. He said that is what she wanted. She is the boss. Ha ha ha. And then he cheated on his wife. I was floored. I had looked up to him all these years, and he cheated on his wife on their separate honeymoons. I was disgusted. I see him once, and after that, he tells me he is unhappy in his marriage. He now has two children. I honestly couldn't care less. Then, six years ago, I got a message from him. He is getting divorced. He is coming to South Africa. Can he crash on the couch? I say sure. He is still family. I haven't seen him in maybe ten years. Maybe he has changed. He arrives. And we have a blast. He hits it off with my fiancé. He is funny and happy, like a weight has been lifted off his shoulders. He tells me they were both cheating. The relationship was extremely volatile. They were always fighting and on edge. They are toxic to each other. She is a total control freak. He is on Tinder and hooking up on the prowl. He leaves for a couple months to travel around South Africa. It is an extremely beautiful and diverse country. Comes back and leaves again. We don't mind. He is fun to have around. One of the weeks he is in town, he meets my friend Jane. Jane is gorgeous, wild and fun out there. They hit it off instantly. He asks her out for a drink, and she says yes. She tells me the next day that they were having a great time, but they must have drunk a lot because she can't remember much of the evening. She vaguely remembers Chad going home with her. They must have had SX. She just can't remember. This is not unusual behavior for Jane. She has a chronic drinking problem. She will get drunk and go home with men all the time. I have learned the hard way not to bring this up. Also, since we are all 40 plus, I am not going to start telling other adults how to live their lives. I am definitely not a saint. Two days later, Chad has to fly back to Namibia and calls Jane from the airport. We are sitting together and having lunch. Chad says that he is so glad he has photographic memories of their time together. She is confused. He then sends her all these naked photos of her, unconscious, lying on the bed. Put them in different positions. She just started crying. She doesn't show them to me, I am sent them at a later stage. She tells him to delete them immediately, and he laughs. She is furious and embarrassed. She starts reflecting on the evening, trying to remember details. She digs through her handbag and finds the receipt cheap bastard left his wallet at home. 2x gin and tonic and 2x tequila. Definitely not enough to get a seasoned drinker blacked out drunk. I am furious, and Jane is furious. For some reason, I think about his as a conviction and Google his name. Holy SHT. I wish I had done this 20 years ago. At the top of the Google search, Namibian rapper released from jail in political blunder. We read this article in silent shock. The truth. Two years before being caught and convicted, he met a woman in a nightclub, drugged her drink, took her home, took naked photos of her, and then saved her. She went to the police the next day. Luckily, there was DNA. Two years later, he gets arrested for drinking and driving. They take his DNA and bam, it's a match to the SA. They have all the surveillance footage and the photos on his phone. Easy conviction, even though he had tried to convince the courts they were dating, and she was a jilted lover. Can I stop for a moment to puke? His story about being innocent and released is all bullshit. Some politician who was trying to make a name for himself decided to release 100 non-violent criminals. 
Chad got on the list somehow. About eight months later, they realized their mistake, rearrested him, and extradited him back to Namibia, hence the separate honeymoons. While in Namibia, he changed his name and took his wife's surname so he could get into Canada. They don't take convicted felons. I tell Jane we need to go to the police, and she says absolutely not. She has dealt with South Africa police with Essa before, and it is worse than the actual event. I tell her I know someone, an ex-policeman, who can help her. We end up getting into a huge fight. She blames me for introducing them. She has had a couple of drinks on top of this devastating realization. She slaps me through the face and leaves the restaurant. I am beyond furious. I am murderous towards Chad. I sent him a message saying that I knew he had drugged and said my friend, and I knew about his real past. He is despicable and disgusting. His response. I am so over your drama. Does this look like she is drugged? And then she proceeds to send me all the naked photos of my friend. I am physically ill. No one wants to see photos of their friend like that. She refuses to take my calls, and that day was the beginning of the end of our friendship. I am haunted. This consumes my thoughts day and night. I decided to message his wife. I say, I am so sorry about your divorce, and I will tell her all the SHT he has said about her. Are you sitting down? There is no divorce. They are having issues with his infidelity, but he promised it would never happen again. He has a therapist who has advised that he should come to South Africa to find himself. I tell her exactly how he is finding himself. She breaks down and tells me everything, from him actually harassing the live-in au pairs, hiding cameras in their bathroom to film them showering, and getting one of them pregnant, there was a huge court case, because he denied it was his and refused to take a DNA test. The court made him take the test, and he is the father. She sends me all the affidavits, court papers, reports from the therapist, etc. She also sent me screenshots of their conversations. Message upon message of him saying how much he misses her, and how this trip will save their marriage. He misses her more and more every day. All the while telling us that she is crazy, abusive, controlling, and cheated on him with his best friend. Spoiler alert. There is no therapist. He created a fake Gmail account and sent reports to his wife on his progress. The therapist basically said she must forgive him for his infidelity because he had a traumatic childhood and he is actually a super nice guy. If I wasn't his therapist, he would be my best friend. I kid you not, that was in the report. I am not sure if his wife was just really gullible or hopeful, but I saw it the minute I opened the first email. I mean the idiot even made the same spelling mistakes and used the same colloquialism. I plot and plan. What is the worst possible thing I can do for him? I am all consumed. In South Africa, you can pay someone for anything. But I am a big believer in karma, so I know I can't use any nefarious means. I realize I have copies of all of his documents, including his passports Namibia and Canada, his ID with his original name on it, and bank statements showing he had loads of money. He was supposed to send money home to his wife. Before he left, he took the proceeds of a car they sold. It was meant for the farm, but he told her he needed it for his sabbatical. He would flip cars in South Africa and double the money. Then, as I remember, he changed his name and took her surname so he could get into Canada. So for about a year, I went backwards and forwards in my head. Do I report him to Canadian immigration? What will the repercussions be? I was troubled and torn. I am not a malicious person. I was still effed off and felt like I needed to do something. I am a person of action. Then I heard he had done the same thing to someone extremely close to me Annie, during the same period as Jane. She only remembered it a year later after extensive therapy. So I sat down in front of my laptop and wrote the most detailed, factual and devastating letter of my life. My hands shook the entire time. I put it all in there. The French essay with links to all the newspaper articles, screenshots of messages to me blanked out showing he is distributing naked pictures without consent illegal in South Africa as well. But not much enforcement a full timeline of his life, and highlighting his name change to deliberately deceive Canadian immigration. I made it very clear in my letter report that his behavior had escalated, without recourse. I did not include the affidavits or correspondence from his wife. Even though she knew of his deception, I didn't want her to get into trouble. I pressed send and got very drunk. It was 100% anonymous, so I never got a response. I just carried on with my life and helped Annie get better. Jane and my friendship deteriorated beyond repair. She deliberately started dating my brother, and has turned him against me that is a whole other messed up story that I might write about one day, when it stops hurting. I only told Annie what I did this year. I have kept it a secret for about three years. I know he has not been able to go back to Canada at all. Banned for life. Part of me feels sorry for his kids, and a bigger part of me thinks I did them a favor, especially his daughter, 
whom he had started actualizing saying things like, Isn't she SXY for a 13-year-old? You can see the hot woman she will become etc. Puke a thousand times. The age at which he got pregnant was only 18. I am friends with his ex-wife on Facebook. She is happy on Facebook. New guy, kids are happy. If you got this far, thank you for reading. TLDR my uncle drugged and CA'd my friend. I found out he was a convicted sayer in France and got him banned from Canada, where his wife and children are living. Edit. Our president signed the Cyber Crimes Act this week. It is officially illegal to send messages that unlawfully contain intimate messages. Second story. A sweet story of OP and her stoic husband. The OP posted her husband's story due to a request. I'm using a different account so that my husband doesn't know. Before meeting my current husband, I was married to my ex-husband Dave. Dave and I met when we were five years old. He moved into our neighborhood when he was five. He was this cute boy next door. We became inseparable. Even our parents joked that when we were adults, we would be married. Ever since I learned the concept of marriage, I was determined that I would marry Dave. We were like soulmates. We had the same interests. The same hobbies, the same thoughts. He was my first everything. My first kiss, my first boyfriend. The guy with whom I lost my virginity. Among our friends, we were the perfect couple. After graduating high school, we immediately got married. I got into a good school, but I decided to study with Dave. We got married right after we finished high school. Our parents helped us find an apartment closer to our school. We worked hard. We would often talk about having kids. On our sixth anniversary, we decided that we would try for a baby next year. I still remember the day when we were teenagers and cuddling. We had already decided what our baby's names would be. During our seventh year of marriage, my mom got sick, so I had to stay with her for a while. I was planning to do something special for our seventh anniversary, so I left early to surprise him. I went to my bedroom, and there I saw my husband effing another girl in our marital bed. I can never get that image out of my head. My husband saw me, and his face turned pale. I don't know what happened, but I threw up right on the spot. My husband was giving me the usual, it's not what it looks like, and, I am sorry. It was a mistake. I locked myself in the bathroom. I somehow mustered my strength and called my friend to pick me up. I just don't listen to Dave. When my friend arrived, she charged at Dave. She grabbed some of my things, and we left. I was in a catatonic stage at that point. Eventually, my parents knew, and they supported whatever decision I made. Dave's parents, however, wanted us to be together. There was a huge fight, but eventually we settled for divorce. My whole fairy tale fantasy just shattered. I was spiraling into depression. My parents booked therapy for me. For two years I was like a living corpse. After that my friend pushed me to go on a date. I did, but no one even came close to Dave. I was searching for Dave and every guy. But they all failed to live up to the expectations. That is when I met my now husband Jay. Jay was the opposite of Dave. Dave was funny. He would be the life of the party. I remember one time he made me laugh so hard that I fell from my chair. But Jay was not funny like Dave. He would use humor only for clapbacks and if he wanted to insult someone. He was also very stoic and closed off. Pretty boring to my taste. On our first date, I asked him some questions like, what is your favorite movie? He told me he doesn't watch movies. He likes reading. He didn't even ask me a thing. Except for my educational background, he talked mostly about my field of work but he was not interested in me. We ate dinner in silence. I was 100% sure he would not call me. But two days later, he did. He asked me out on a second date. I was skeptical of whether or not I should go. But my friend insisted. I gave it another try. The second date went slightly better than the first. He talked a bit more. I asked a few questions. We were taking it slow. He was opening up until the sixth date. When he finally hooked up TMI, it was amazing. I am someone who has a snack after having SX. I was craving some, so I asked him if I could grab something from his pantry. Even a bread and cheese sandwich will do. He told me to stay there, and he went out. I was kind of confused. He came back after 20 minutes with takeout food. It was something I really liked orange chicken. I asked how he knew. He told me. You told me on our previous date. I melted right there. Dave and I have been together for most of my life. But he never made the effort to go out and get me something. That's when I knew, even if he was not my soulmate, that I was madly in love with him. We dated for three years and got married. I came to know about Jay's family too. His mom and dad were drug addicts who died of overdoses. He was homeless for a while, but worked his way up. Throughout our marriage, I was very, very happy. He was different from Dave because whenever he would see me doing chores, he would ask, Need help? 
He helped me through my trauma from Dave by arranging a therapist who specializes in infidelity. He may not be a person of words, but his actions tell me that he loves me. When I was pregnant with our daughter, I would wake him up in the middle of the night to either get me food or rub my feet. He would say, yes ma'am, and get to work. I love him. Even after 15 years of marriage, my love has not stopped. He is still the stoic man I fell in love with. After meeting him, I stopped believing in the concept of a soulmate. He was not mine, but somehow we made it work. I love you Jay. Thanks for being there in my life. And anyone who is wondering what happened to Dave, he is getting his third divorce. His mom blames me for his downfall, but she refuses to see that her son cheated in every marriage. Edit. I am sorry if there was any typing mistake. I am typing on my phone, and the autocorrect is acting nuts. I tried to turn it off, but it didn't work. Some comments. Who knows? Maybe Jay is your soulmate. He seems to have been more ideally suited to you from the beginning than Dave ever was. OP replies. From the outside, we do not look like soulmates. Dave and I were the typical girl next door and boy next door kind of people. Jay was more closed off. Initially, when I was dating him, he was really rude, in my opinion. He also has a bad temper towards people who screw up. But other than that, he is good and kind. He helps those who genuinely need help. After reading this, all I can say is F Dave metaphorically and F J literally in several positions, then have a nice dessert. I'm glad to hear you are happy. I hope you Jay, and your kids have many, many more happy years ahead of you. OP replies, F J literally in several positions, then have a nice dessert. I have been doing that for 18 years lol. And he still gets me a snack. 3. His mom blames me for his downfall. Because it can't be the fault of her effing child being an immoral, faulty human being, could it? I am Polly. I have a different attitude toward SX around a relationship. But promises are promises regardless. Commitment is commitment no matter what flavor. And Dave is clearly emotionally incomplete. I never believed in soulmates from childhood. But you know when it works, when it's right, you just had to have a trial marriage to refine your definition. OP replies. According to his mom, he was devastated when I wanted divorce. She tried to convince me to stay with him, even after knowing he had so cheated. She was angry at me and my parents when I said no. She blames me because she thinks that if I had stayed, her son would not have become a serial cheater because I could fix him. His other marriage failed because he was a mess because of me. Not because he was effing other people on the side. Dave was never your soul mate. Jay was. It just took time to find him. OP replies. When I asked Jay if he believes in soulmates, he told me. I don't believe that crap. It's just like a horoscope. People believe in it because it makes them feel better. A lot of potential good relationships get broken because of this crap. I was kind of devastated that he doesn't believe in soulmates. Can you believe that in these 18 years, we have only said, I love you five times as far as I can count. I want to say it more. Update. I said I love you to my husband after five years. My husband 47M and I 46F have been together for 18 years and married for 15. My husband is not the type who always shows his feelings. He is very stoic, smiles on very few occasions, and maintains a routine. Some even say that he is a robot. But I don't think so. I am someone who is very outgoing and completely opposite of him. Before I was married to him, I was married to someone else who cheated on me. I used to say, I love you, a lot in my first marriage. But after my divorce, I had some sort of aversion to those words. Over the last 18 years, we have said, I love you, only five times. The first time was when we were dating. The second was on our wedding day. The third and fourth were when our daughter and son were born. And the fifth was five years ago on Christmas, when we were really tipsy because of the drinks. I wrote a post about how I met him and how we got together. But it made me realize that we haven't said, I love you to each other for a long time. But it didn't bother me. Even if he never said it, he always shows that he loves me in his actions. He does chores for me, he will always give me a foot massage, make me my favorite dish, and even kiss me out of the blue. I do not have any complaints. He is the best husband anyone could ever ask for. But this was something that has been in the back of my mind for a while. We cuddle, we hang out, we make love, but still no, I love you. I would love to hear it and say it more often, but somehow it just makes me nervous. I decided to buckle up and just say it. It's just three words. So yesterday, when he was reading a book on the couch, I stood in front of him and said, I love you. He looked at me and was confused. I repeated it. For the first time, I could see him get flustered. He told me, okay? I was a little disappointed by his response. I thought he just didn't love me anymore. Later that night, when I was lying down, he came to our bedroom 
and told me that he was sorry for his response. That caught him off guard. He told me that he loved me a lot. And not even a day goes by that he doesn't feel lucky to have me in his life. I was tearing up. That was better than my confession. I asked him, why don't we say that often? He told me that he doesn't say it because, throughout his entire life, no one has said it to him except for me. His parents were drug addicts who cared less for him. He had to start working at age 14. He grew up in hardship, so saying, I love you is weird for him. But also, he feels like we don't have to tell each other when we express it with our actions way more. I told him I wanted to say it more now and wanted him to say it back, if that's okay with him. I saw him smile for a while, and he said it was fine as long as I wanted it. I don't think we need to say it when we know we love each other a lot. We will probably stop saying it after a few days and go back to our mundane events. Update. Story of my husband Jay. A lot of you have been asking me and personally messaging me about Jay's upbringing and how he managed to survive. Well, I am not sure if I am the right person to talk about his personal life. I mean I heard some parts that really made me cry. Therefore, I will try to summarize it. So, my husband Jay is an only child. His mom and dad were from a poor family. They were drug addicts. His household was a mess. He remembers his father pushing him down the stairs when he was like eight. Jay mostly grew up with his grandfather, his mom's dad. As far as I know, his mom was not allowed to come to his grandfather's house. Jay mostly spent his weekdays at his house. His mom and dad didn't care. They were always high and had odd visitors. His grandfather taught him a lot of things. Like handling tools, woodwork, and electric repair stuff. Ever since he was little, with some advice from his grandfather, he learned that his parents are very useless. He has to survive on his own. All they know is how to use drugs and invite people to have group SX. He started doing odd jobs like dog sitting, car and window washing, and gardening. He also tutored from time to time. Shortly after, his parents died of an overdose. He became a permanent resident of his grandfather's house. He worked so that he could afford to go to college. His grandfather had little money for him. But it wasn't enough. He thought about joining the army at age 18. But he failed the physical test. When he was 17, his grandfather died of a heart attack. His grandfather lived in a rented house, so Jay couldn't live there anymore. He was forced to live in a homeless shelter throughout high school. He even got bullied and got in trouble for standing up for his bullies. But since he was a good student, he didn't face serious repercussions. He left the homeless shelter when a pastor from their local church took him in. He knew Jay because he worked at the church for a while. The pastor was a nice guy. He funded his living and also helped him get a scholarship to a good university. Jay studied finance and business. His entire childhood, he lived in poverty. So he was obsessed with learning how to make money. He made some connections, which landed him a good part-time job during his final year. I met Jay through my friend. She worked for the same company as him. He worked as an investment banker at that time. And the rest, you all know. This is pretty much it. I understand why he is so stoic and doesn't show his emotions. I once asked out of curiosity if he saw the harsh reality of life. But still, how does he manage to stay good? He once told me about this couple whose children he used to tutor. They were a really happy family in his eyes. The husband loved his wife. He mentioned that the husband would always have a hand on his wife's body as a form of affection. Their children were also well behaved and had a good childhood. From that moment on, he knew he wanted a family like that. Because he never had a complete family. But he was sure that somebody would not be able to love him because he doesn't know how to show love. Throughout his entire childhood, he has only seen his parents fight and cheat on each other in front of each other. That really destroyed his perception of love. If it weren't for that couple, he probably wouldn't believe that there are people in this world who can love each other for life. It is a little wrong of me to say he displays no emotions. He does, but on rare occasions. I remember the day our daughter was born. Jay held her and cried loudly. He kept repeating. I will protect you. I will never leave you. He did say, I love you to both me and her. The same thing happened when our son was born. I mean it gave me an idea to just pop out babies so that I could see his emotional face. But anyway, I know he does love me and our little family. He always holds me tight whenever we are cuddling. He is really good with my parents. My parents also adore him. Sometimes, it just makes me cry knowing that he has been through a lot and that I have lived such a sheltered life. Sometimes, I feel like I don't deserve him because he is very kind and a good person. Also yeah, we do say, I love you, a lot more now. Thank you for watching the video. If you are interested in listening to these kinds of stories, we've got more in store for you. Simply subscribe to our channel, hit the like button, and share it with your friends.